Those of you who were, those of you who were observant will have realized that uh, Gary read the same passage that he read last month. Uh, did you notice that? Um, last month, I changed the message that I was to preach at the very last minute. Um, it wasn't magic. I did have notes to more than one message, but uh, it was based on the same passage. But this month, we've gone back to the message that I originally planned to bring last month. So we've started again with the same passage from Malachi, but the next passage is a different one, Ephesians chapter 3. It's a very well-known passage. I think you'll be very familiar with it. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God." Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. There's a couple of things in there that the Archbishop of York has just told me that I shouldn't say. Have you heard his latest ridiculous pronouncement? A man in a gold frock and a fish god hat who spends his time blaspheming the word of God in, the, in what was supposed to be a speech for Christian unity, would you believe? You can't have Christian unity unless you build it on the right foundation. And the unity in Christ comes from the unity of the gospel, which comes from the unity of his word. If you blaspheme and contradict and countermand his, his word, you'll never get unity in Christ, except that which is built on a false and dangerous foundation. So we've read in the Old Testament of a people lacking blessing. They were living supposedly as the chosen people, but this had not really become a reality in their lives. The children of Israel were given a place in special relationship to God the Father, and this should have been something which set them apart from the nations around them. Foreigners and neighbors should have been able to see that the Israelites were a people apart, a people who had been promised a special blessing from the Almighty. Yet, this was not the case. Time and again, the children of Israel had suffered defeat and humiliation. And certainly in this passage in Malachi, they do not seem to be enjoying the benefits of their position as they should. They were satisfied with less than the best. Now, sadly, today, that's very often the case in many Christian churches, in many meetings this morning. People are satisfied with that that they have because they don't realize they have less than the best. People, uh, even evangelical believers who claim to believe the Word of God, often consider themselves to be satisfied with as far as they've gone. And Jeff has very kindly led into this this morning by saying that there should be a new, uh, in a sense, a new experience, a new depth each time you come to the breaking of bread. There should be a constant moving on. And the sad thing is that many Christians, evangelical believers included, have come to a point where they've become comfortable and they've settled down. I've moved house many times in my life because of my work and I've had to up sticks and move at short notice more than once. I know some of you have done that, but uh, I've... Uh, People have said, oh, never mind, you'll soon settle down. And I learned very quickly to say, oh, I hope not. I don't want to settle down. That's a phrase I never use, never settle down. Christian believers should never settle down. 
Wherever you are now, I mean, you may have been in your house for many, many years. You may consider yourself, you're at Jeff's age, that you're in your place of retirement, and the next place is the place with the big metal gates and the smoke coming out the chimney. But you don't know. The Lord could call you anywhere. The Lord could call you at any moment, at any age, to go anywhere. Are we prepared to do that? I was at Bible college. I had a friend there. I had more than one friend there, but I have this particular friend, I remember, we sang in the service, and our, the worship at the college sometimes was over an hour before the actual service got started. But uh, we, we sang, Here I Am, Wholly Available. Do you know the one? Uh, Ask for me, I will serve the Lord. And I noticed, I just noticed, but glancing across the church, a big church full of people, that he wasn't singing it for some reason. And I was concerned, because that perhaps there's some problem. So after the service was over, and we'd had coffee, and we'd gone back to the recreation center uh, to relax I said to her, I noticed you didn't sing it here I am wholly available is there a problem why did you not sing it and he said because I'm not and rather than judging him and condemning him and saying that's a terrible thing to say I think I said it's a long long time ago but I think I said that's a very honest thing to say because he was really bothered about it. He said, I feel that I've let the Lord down. And I said, well, there's probably a lot of people in the church who felt the same as you, but sang it anyway. So there's something to be said for not saying it. As Jeff has already said, there's something to be said for not taking communion on one particular occasion because the Lord is dealing with something spiritually deep inside yourself. That's different to getting all hung up on things and not taking communion week after week because you feel terribly unworthy. That's different. We take communion because we're unworthy not because we're worthy. And the Bible tells us we have to prepare ourselves to come to the breaking of bread. We're not coming to the table because we're worthy. We don't have to feel worthy before we come to the table. We actually have to realize that we're unworthy. So don't get too bogged down with feeling unworthy. That's the point I'm trying to make. That's just a little extra. That's a free, a free extra. I have to be careful because... Erin's got one of her heads, and I noticed you moved away. You were down here earlier on. I noticed you've moved a long way away. I've got to. But people are generally satisfied with less than the best. Also, the other side of the coin, people are always telling us that we need things that we don't actually need. You may have convinced yourself that you need an awful lot of the luxuries that you've surrounded yourself with, and actually the Lord may one day require of you to learn you don't actually need them. What do we actually need? We were talking last evening about people trying to flog things over the telephone. And uh, I, uh, it reminded me, I was once sitting in a long queue of traffic. Every, one of those days when everything stopped for no apparent reason. And I had nothing else to do but sit there. And the phone rang. And I don't normally answer if it's not a number I recognize. If the name doesn't come up or it's, I don't recognize it, no, I don't normally bother answering it. They will, if it's important, they'll leave a message. If it isn't important, I don't want to know. But on this occasion, sitting in a big queue of traffic with nothing to do, I answered it anyway. I thought, I'll see who it is. And it was a young man selling life insurance, or life assurance. And uh, I'm, I don't need life assurance, but I, I allowed him to talk. It was actually, he was very nice. I felt a bit sorry for him because he was, you know, he was on commission. He had to sell so much a day in order to earn a living. A lot of people have to do that. So I listened to him for a moment, and he, he, he gave me all the reasons. He never asked me anything about me, you see. That's the issue. He never asked my situation, my family, or anything. He just launched into his spiel that he's been trained to say to everybody. And he gave me this great long list of fantastic benefits I would get if only I bought his life insurance and he, and he, and he asked all these questions he said do you, do you not worry that uh, your family may not be able to afford to pay for your funeral I said no not at all don't. He said, are you honestly not bothered? I said, I'm at least a bit bothered. I don't care a hoot whether they can afford to pay for my funeral. He said, well, that's a strange attitude to say. He said, do you not think your family will worry if, if there isn't enough money? I said, no, I don't think they'll be like, worry at all. And he said, well, why, why would they not worry? I said, because they're all dead. <laughs> They've all gone before me. So that took about five minutes of his time up before he realized that. So then he realized that, no, <coughs> paying for the funeral wasn't a problem. Uh, I could just clear off and leave somebody else to clear up the mess. But uh, then he tried to say, oh, but you can have... Because <coughs> I'd say, so you see, I don't need life for sure. I really don't need it. And he said, oh, but you can have a, a cash payment if you fall seriously ill. He said, how would you like to have enough money to buy a Range Rover? And I said, well, actually... 
and at that point I just sold my father's house that I'd inherited and I moved into a temp temporary flat which I'm still in six years later but I've, I just sold the house and put the money to one side and I said actually to be quite honest with you I could actually go out and buy a Range Rover tomorrow if I really wanted one if I wanted to blow it and spend loads of money it would be foolish but lots of people do that kind of thing don't they I said actually I could buy a Range Rover if I really wanted one I said and besides that here's me I've fallen seriously ill you've given me the money I'm lying desperately in my hospital bed I suppose I could prop myself up on one elbow and admire the beautiful Range Rover that's parked in the hospital car park. I said, other than that, I can't think of any reason why somebody who's cl chronically ill, possibly terminally ill, really needs a brand new Range Rover. And he said, well, yeah, I suppose you've got a point there, sir. And we went on for about 20 minutes and he said, finally, he said, you know, you're not going to buy anything from me, are you? <laughs> I said, no, I'm sorry I'm not. I really don't. And he said, I, really, I do think possibly you actually don't need the product, he grudgingly admitted. And I say, he was a very nice guy but he said before you hang up sir I said well the traffic started to move now so I'm gonna have to go and he said before you hang up can I ask you one more question and I said yes go on he said well you've sold a house you've got no family no relatives you can afford a Range Rover can I give up this job and come and move and live with you <laughs> and I said no I'm sorry I really don't need that either if you don't mind but we came, we went off the phone sadly he'd spent 20 25 minutes talking to me and not selling anything but eventually he realized all these wonderful reasons why I needed his product he finally had to admit that probably Mr. Brooking on that occasion was one of the people in the world that really didn't need his product any more than I need double glazing somebody rang me recently to try to sell me uh, solar panels to put on the roof and they went on for 10 minutes they rang on the landlines I can't tell who it is on the landline and they went on for 10 minutes or so about all the wonderful benefits of solar panels on your roof and I said but I don't think it'll be suitable for me and oh yes it'll be suitable for you it's suitable for everybody I said I really don't think it'll be suitable but they carried on their spiel for ages and ages and eventually I said but can I ask you one question and they said yes I said do you not think the people who live upstairs would mind the solar panels on my because I'm not on the top floor you see and he said you're telling me that somebody lives above you I said yes and he hung up in a hoof <laughs> but if he'd asked me that at the beginning I'd have told him that first time round you see but I thought he'll find out eventually I don't need solar panels I haven't actually got a roof to put them on but people try to tell us that we need all kinds of things that we don't actually need but at the other side of the bargain we sometimes become satisfied spiritually speaking now we become satisfied with what we have when really we should be constantly moving on for something more the children of Israel had been promised a special communion with God but they did not appear to be benefiting from it not if you read Malachi chapter 3 the spiritual principle was not working out in practice and so today those who've been born again by the Spirit of God those who've moved into the assurance of salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ which I trust is you this morning you have also been promised a special blessing Paul writing to the Ephesians speaks of being filled with the fullness of God now we could just dwell on that for the rest of the day or the rest of the week what does it mean being filled with the fullness of God Paul obviously thought that was achievable he obviously thought that that was a position to which you could attain not through your own strength but through God's guidance and God's deliverance the gift and privilege of every believer is to be moving forward towards that point where you become filled with the fullness of God yet across this land we find Christians for whom the spiritual principle does not work out in practice my pastor in Scotland used to say the preacher preaches full cream and lives skim milk we don't live up to that which we proclaim Jeff's going to be relieved now because I'm going to finally turn the first page what is described in the scriptures as a life of triumph is often more a path of steady defeat there seems to be something lacking in the day-to-day -day working out of our experience and to be honest we have to confess that it is often the same for us 
we cry out for blessing. We pray earnestly for revival fire to fall upon our people and upon our land. And yet life is such a slog at times. Two steps forward and one step back. Sometimes if we're honest, one step forward and two steps back depending on what kind of a day we're having. In some churches, there appears to be an outpouring of blessing. I use the word appears. There appears to be an outpouring of blessing. There's certainly a lot of noise, and preachers get fired up, and the congregation get excited, yet all too often it seems to dribble away, and what once appeared to be a move of God seems to end prematurely without any lasting effect. I was caught up in the beginning of what became known as the charismatic movement. I was um, recently saved in, in round about 1980, 81. And one of the big movements of the charismatic movement started in West Yorkshire. And our little youth fellowship was caught up in that. It tore churches apart, the length and breadth of the county. Um, between those who wanted to go with it and those who didn't. But it was all very exciting. And I went to meetings and I loved the worship. I got all excited. I got quite carried away. I loved it. It was new. For someone who was brought up in a Methodist Sunday school, it was new. It was different. It was exciting. It was thrilling for a while. And what happened to it? I could list you men who prophesied that God was going to bring revival that was going to sweep this country. I can list the men that made the prophecies and when they made them. None of them came true. Now the Bible has something to say for, about false prophets who make proclamations in God's name that fail to come true. But it happened again and again. Then everybody rushed off to Toronto to get this apparent blessing. Everybody rushed to Pensacola to get an apparent blessing. People have rushed, literally rushed around the world to try and catch a blessing and bring it back home in a paper bag. You can't even do that. It's not even spiritually possible. But all these blessings, all these exciting revivals have all dribbled away. Or they've gone down the Swanee quite dramatically like Hillsong and other things organizations where it has been discovered there's been wholesale sinful living behind the scenes uh, financial stuff sexual all kinds of stuff apparently wholesale going on for years we've heard it from the america many times over that and maybe that's the reason why it's all gone pear shade but so many times the sad thing is the same people who rush after blessing a are the same people they're disappointed being disappointed with God is a serious, serious problem. Rushing into something that you think God has something wonderful for you and then seeing it dribble through your fingers, that is a serious problem because it leads to disappointment. And you're actually disappointed with God because you've misunderstood. It's not God's fault. But you're disappointed with what God has done. And that can be a spiral downwards if you're not careful. But the same people who rush after blessing A, get hurt, get damaged, rush off after blessing B when it comes along. Get hurt and damaged again. And then they rush after blessing C when it comes along. Always looking for something thrilling and exciting. And that's what we have today in some churches across the country. I'm not saying that, that, that not, none of them are genuine. But what I'm saying is we have to be very careful with what is genuine and what is not. We have to analyze what the teaching is that underlies the apparent blessing. Where they're going, what direction they're going in according to the word of God. But there's often a lot of noise, a lot of excitement. Congregations can get carried away. But it dribbles away. And when there has been genuine revival in the 1740s and 50s under the Wesleys and George Whitfield and many, many others in the uh, early 1900s in Wales and in Northern Ireland in the 1950s in the Outer Hebrides, you know, the great revival happened. God really did bless. But where is it now? Where has it gone how has it dribbled away? Is there a secret that we can learn to stop this happening? How can we make certain that our walk, our walk with the Lord is the vital, vibrant thing that it should be? 
And I'm again here standing, as I have done for so many times now. I'm standing here with the great danger of you thinking I know all about it and I'm trying to bring you up to my level. That is not the case at all. That's not the preacher's job. The preacher is to bring what the Lord has laid on his heart. It does not imply for a moment that the preacher thinks he's made it. I do not think I've got to where I'm talking about and you should all catch up with me. I'm in the same place as you are. So how do we do it? Well, now I'm starting the sermon. Points one, two, and three. I'm all right. Break up, give up, and soak up. There you are, you've got it. That's it, you can go home now. Break up, give up, and soak up. Our first clue is to be found in the Old Testament in Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. I shall read it before you can find it. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. It's often the cry today for latter rain, for a downpour of revival. Yet we have seen many times over the dreadful results of a sudden downpour. We had one last night, didn't we? Late last night where I was in Formby, absolutely tipped it down. And I had water running down my bedroom window like a, like a shower because the gutterings were all overflowing. There was so much water in such a short time, the gutterings couldn't hold it. And it was pouring everywhere. I looked out of the window and the houses across the way were all the same. Water was gushing over the tops of the gutterings rather than coming down the drain pipes. Just for a short time. Time. And I thought, well, if that went on indefinitely, if that went on for a couple of days, we'd be in serious trouble. And that's happened again and again and again. Floods of water, far from being desirable, over a very short and very intense period, can bring disaster. There was an issue in Cornwall, wasn't there, when I was down, living in Cornwall. There was a, a sudden flood down one of the little narrow river valleys. And if you watched it on your news at the time, you'd have seen cars and motorhomes floating out in the sea. Because the water had come through a car park and just took everything. And it left a whole village completely devastated. Houses broken in two, all kinds of tragedy. Terrible thing. It only took a short time. Just a few minutes like a tsunami coming down the hillside, to, uh, took everything with it. And then within two days of something like that happening, the water companies are telling us we're on a host pipe ban because there's a drought coming. Because it's all gone. It rushes in, it destroys, and then rushes out again. And the reason being that the ground, if it's not prepared, cannot receive it all at once. You see the point. And in a spiritual sense, I fear that many of us are not yet ready to receive what we earnestly pray that God will give. Hard ground cannot hold the floods. The water simply runs off the fields and it floods the rivers. It hits concrete. Now, one of our problems nowadays, we have so much concrete where there used to be fields. People build houses on floodplains where they should never build them in the first place. And then they expect the government to pay them lots of lovely compensation when they wake up one morning to find that the river's just on a level with their second floor windows. I get flood warnings on the telephone where I live because I live next to the River Air. At three o'clock in the morning, the phone rings next to my bed. My phone never rings at any time of day. My phone hardly ever rings unless they're trying to sell me life insurance. But the, the phone rings at three o'clock in the morning. <gasps> what is this? When my dad was alive, I used to panic instantly when the phone rang in the middle of the night. I thought it was some serious problem. Now my dad's gone, I don't panic the same because there's nobody left to worry about. But pick up the phone at three o'clock in the morning and you say, yes, yes. And then you get a recorded message. This is a flood warning from Yorkshire Water. Please take immediate action. The river air is expected. I said, I'm on the third floor. The people downstairs are going to be really in trouble if it reaches my level. The flood warning for me is really not necessary because of where I live. But I get the warning because the authorities realize when the water comes down from the river, which it did on Boxing Day seven years ago, and when, when Malham Cove, if you know Malham Cove and the Yorkshire Dales, that's a, an extinct waterfall. The water now comes out of the bottom of it. It doesn't run over. On that occasion, the water came over the waterfall for the first time in decades. There was so much water came down onto the hills of North Yorkshire. It came down the river air. I saw it. It took containers. You know the containers on the back of articulated lorries? 
stories. He took them down the river. I went down with my camera you know, the following day, and there were piles of cars on top of each other where they'd been swept into heaps. It only took a short time. Devastated a lot of lives. What every farmer and gardener will tell you is that we need prolonged but gentle rain over a length of time. That's what we really need. On a hot summer evening, I love to, I might have told you this before, when it's been one of those days like yesterday, when it gets hotter and muggier as the day goes on, and then suddenly there's a, a big dark cloud comes along and there's a loud bang. And I love to go outside and stand under my brolly and listen to the plants lapping it up. We love it. You can almost feel the grass and the flowers gasping in the water. At last, at last, the water we need. Because the ground has been prepared and the world is ready to receive. So there is hard ground, fallow ground, as Hosea calls it, which has been fruitless for years in many Christian lives. God is calling us to break it up. He's calling us not only to pray for revival, but to prepare for it, to actually do something to prepare for it. People have often asked me, and you know, pastorally after services and the like, people have often said, how do I, how do I get God to break me out of this, whatever this might be? And my advice usually would be, first of all, check what part you have to play. Don't just, am I right saying this? <laughs> Don't just wait for God to break the chains. You have to do something to break them yourself. Just sitting there with your arms folded, you're expecting God to do it, waiting and doing nothing yourself. That may be the reason why it's taking so long, because there are things we have to do to break our own chains. There's an attitude of mind, an attitude of spirit. We have to get ourselves into the right place where God is able to do things with us, and we have to actually work at it. It can be hard work. Too many Christians expect life to be easy. I expected life to be easy when I was first saved. I thought everything would change. All my problems would go away. <laughs> it didn't work like that. If it worked like that for you, I'm very happy for you. But it didn't work like that for me, and it never has. We have to work at it. It's what the Bible calls a sacrifice of praise sometimes. I've mentioned that before, I know. It's one of my favorite passages. A sacrifice of praise where you have to start singing. You have to start singing where you are. Wherever, whatever you, however dark it is, however hard it is, however difficult it is, you have to sit down and start praising. Even though you don't feel like it. If you wait until you feel like it before you start praising, you may never feel like it. But I have found, I can say this personally, I have found many times, I've had to relearn the lesson many times over, to sit down in the darkness and put my head in my hands and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. Praise me. And that's where knowing hymns off by heart comes in very handy. Knowing scriptures off by heart, of course, is absolutely essential. They come back to you when you least expect it, when you're in dire distress. Knowing good theological hymns, not the namby-pamby ditties that a lot of people sing today, but the good theological stuff, get it in your heart and soul and sing it when you need to sing it. Not when you feel like singing it, but when your heart tells you that you need to sing it. Sit down and say, Lord, I will praise you. It's an act of will. I will praise you. I will glorify your name, even at this time. As uh, Linda mentioned about the words in the song, was it? About passing, carrying on, laboring in weakness until the day God gives us the strength, when he renews our bodies one day finally, which he will do, that's a promise, but until he gives us the strength in the meantime. So there is fallow ground which needs to be broken up because it is time to seek the Lord till he rain righteousness upon us. Then there's a clue in our original text in Malachi, verse, uh, chapter 3, Verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven, 
and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Doesn't that sound great? The children of Israel were lacking in blessing because they were withholding something from the Lord. They were not willing to give up that which was required of them. So we've broken up the fallow ground and then we have to give up. And I don't mean to give up in defeat, to pack up and go home. I mean to give up that which the Lord requires of us. To allow him to take from us that which he wants from us. I don't just mean the nasty, horrible things. The Lord obviously requires us to give up that which is wrong. But sometimes he requires us to give up the things which are right. I went to Bible college. I knew God would want me to give up the things which were bad. I had no idea when I went to Bible college he was going to ask me to give up some of the things that were good. Some of the very things that he himself had given me. Some of the things which saved my life when I was saved, when I was 18, 19, 20. Those very things that God had blessed me with, I had to start giving some of them up. Now, I was ready to give up the bad things, but I wasn't ready to give up the good things. I wanted to hold on to them. But the Lord spoke very clearly, showed me, I need you to give some of these things up. Of course, when you give things up to the Lord, he always gives you more back. He never leaves you destitute. But the children of Israel were lacking in blessing because they were withholding something from the Lord. The scripture here is very clear in Malachi that they had not brought to the house of God all the tithes and offerings. They'd paid lip service to the Lord, but they'd held something back. And the saddest part of this is they didn't know. They think about that. That's the saddest part. They didn't know realize you read malachi again they turned round to god and they said how have we robbed you they didn't realize that they'd robbed god it wasn't just that they weren't giving him what he required the, the saddest part was that they didn't realize they weren't giving him what they required and that is the case today in church after church after church across this country people they're not withholding from god on purpose they don't even realize ichabod the glory of the Lord has departed. That was discussed over the breakfast table. That's the deep conversation you have when you stay at the Fazakalis. The glory of the Lord has departed. You read that in the scripture. What does it say? That they didn't realize Ichabod was written over the door. I listened just for a couple of minutes to the, to the archbishop's speech online and I thought this man doesn't realize that it the glory of God has long departed from the Church of England. Long ago. They're playing in costume. They've no idea what's actually already happened. Never has there been a time to claim that scripture, come out from among them lest you be partaken of, your, of their sins. But they don't realize that the blessing has gone because they've got so used to not having it, it's become normal. It's become a religious tradition. Bells and smells, gongs and pongs. It's a religious thing that you just do Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and you don't realize that it's gone. Could talk about Samson next time I come, possibly. Samson had the same problem. He didn't realize eventually. It was a long story, Samson. But when, when she found that woman, there's always a woman in it, isn't there? That woman... <laughs> I can say that as an unmarried man. <laughs> that, I had a, one of my closest friends at college firmly believed that the only purpose of a woman was to come between God and man. <laughs> firmly believed that. He's been married for many years and I think has three children now, so obviously he found out he was wrong. But the woman, Delilah, she tried several times and Samson, stupid like a man, fell for it every time. But eventually when she finally cut his hair, he didn't realize that he lost his power until he tried to fight. When he woke up and he jumped up, he thought he was just the same as always. He didn't realize the power had gone. 
This morning, God expects his children to give him all that he requires. Now, that may mean something slightly different to each individual believer, but you know what God requires of you, and it is your responsibility to be obedient in that. We have a God who makes demands upon us. That's not a popular teaching. Charismatic movement doesn't tell you much about that. We have a God who makes demands upon us. There's so much talk about the love of God. And often the, the path of a Christian is sometimes portrayed as an informal, happy-go-lucky affair where you skip through the meadows holding hands with pink rabbits. That kind of idea, that's what being a Christian is. And you find that individuals walk openly in sin and compromise. And teachers would have us believe that if you talk about the love of God, somehow that will cover up everything else. You dwell on the love of God enough, you don't have to worry about sin and truth and honesty and decency and integrity. Just talk about the love and keep that going. But we serve a God who, for our own perfect good, demands things from his children and places demands upon his children just like any loving caring parent does Christians hold back from giving what they should they keep unto themselves that which should be given over to the Lord and then they complain because God does not seem to be blessing them old-time revival began with prayer amongst the believers and it began with a conviction of sin out there in the world, which was a result of the prayer within the believers. You read the stuff, particularly places like the Hebrides. We've got an expert on the Outer Hebrides with us this morning, so I have to be careful what I say. But if you go back to Stornoway, you can still hear the old stories. And I heard them when I was a youngster because my auntie was there with Duncan Campbell in the 1950s working with the Faith Mission where God indeed swept in and people fell on their faces in the fields and in the roads desperately coming to the church hall to literally say, what must I do to be saved? They were falling from conviction of sin without being evangelized particularly. It was just a result of the, pray, the faithful prayer of the church. Prayful, the faithful prayer of a small number of people within the believing church. In the financial realm alone, God is shortchanged by his church. If every Christian, every person that claims to be a Christian, gave financially into God's service as he requires, there'd never be the need for a coffee morning, a bring and buy, or a jumble sale. And God's house across this country would no longer resemble a house of merchandise. And the people who live near the churches would be out of the situation where the only time they ever hear from the vicar is when he wants some money to keep the church tower going. And yet the scriptures are talking of far deeper and wider things than money. We must give up our attitudes, our outlook, perhaps even our very lives. Because that is what God requires. Then, and only then, will God open the very windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon his people that we so earnestly desire him to do also have to go out of your way I've just come back from the north of Scotland I'm very thankful the Lord enabled me another trip to the north of Scotland I had to do it as cheaply as I possibly could but I got there and thank the Lord my little car got right round 1,900 miles in 12 days and I saw for the first time in my life Slavonian grebes hands up who knows what a Slavonian grebe is Nobody at all. I'm disappointed. You're just uneducated, you lot. I, mean, I, know you, you've, I know you don't have them in Southport, so it doesn't matter. But uh, I, went, I saw Slavonian grebes. I didn't know they were there, but somebody told me where they actually bred. And they're like ospreys. They're very faithful in breeding sites. So if they've bred somewhere, you're fairly certain they're going to go back to the same place the next year. And I saw them for the first time. I was quite excited. You may think that's a bit sad, but I was quite excited at seeing Slavonian grebes. I sent a text to a friend. I've seen my first Slavonian grebe. 
dream. And the guy sent a text back and said, what on earth is one of those? Because I was just not in Loch Ness, but a small loch very near Loch Ness. That was where they were. And I said, they said, what's a Savonian grebe? So I sent a text back. I said, it's 300 feet long with seven hoops sticking up out the water. I think it's a Slavonian grebe. But my point is, what was my point? Can I remember what my, oh yeah, my point is that I had to go considerably out of my way to see them. I had to make a long journey. I had to plan it. I had to know where I was going. I had to read about it. I had to prepare myself by reading the guidebook, following its instructions and its guidance to make sure I was in the right place where I was able to receive what God was able to give. Do you see why I'm holding the Bible in front of me at this point? And then I had to travel and I had to spend money and I had to spend time and then I was blessed by seeing Slavonian Greaves, which I would not have seen if I'd sat on my third floor balcony waiting for one to land on the passing lorry. We have to sometimes go out of our way. Thirdly, hey, I'm well in time this morning, aren't I? You should have spoken for longer. Thirdly, we are called to soak up. I've forgotten the first two now. What were the first two? Break up and give up, that's right. Break up, give up, and soak up. Soak up that which the Lord bestows. A blessing is not for a moment just to disappear with the morning mist. The world has had enough of Christians who are up and down in their experience. I've worked with them, believe me. It's a long time ago now, so none of you will know anybody I'm talking about, so I'm free to speak about it. I've worked with Christians. They are on a high one day. Everything's right, and you're expected to be up there on the high with them. And all the unsaved staff, they're witnessing, they're shoving scriptures down their throat, they're lecturing them, and I've got unsaved staff begging me to please don't put me on the same shift as them because they're driving me crackers. It's a sad thing, that, when, when non-Christians are asking not to be put on a shift with a Christian, that's a sad thing. It happens more often than you might think. I speak as a, when I was a Christian employer. I had unsaved staff asking me not to be put on a shift with a Christian. Not because they didn't like them, but because they were constantly pushing scriptures at them and wouldn't leave them alone. And then maybe the following week or a couple of shifts further down the line, something had gone wrong, everything had blown up in there, and they were down on the floor. And it was the non-Christian staff that were having to cheer the Christians up to try and get them out of the doldrums. The world's had enough of that. That's not a witness. If a Christian can't work out how to live their own life, then they can't tell anybody else how to live theirs. We need to soak up that which God bestows so that we keep it. Not that we feel blessed one minute and want everybody to join in with the blessing and then next day we are knocked sideways by events and find ourselves most miserable and anybody that's cheerful and wants to smile, <laughs> it's all right for you. you. I'm not saying we should never be down. Don't, I'm not condemning you if you feel down this morning or if you didn't when you came in, but you do now. I can understand. But there are times when we are down. That's the normal Christian walk because that's the normal human experience. I'm not saying that Christians should never get down. That is a part of experience. What I'm saying is Christians should not be like this. They should not be up and down constantly all the time, expecting everybody to be up when they are, but not wanting to know when they don't feel like it. That is a disaster for any church fellowship. Christian walk should be more like that, with the odd down and then another. <laughs> you see, we're going generally up. There's a new experience. Each time we come to the communion table, we should be moving on. Occasionally we slip back, but we should then pick ourselves up and move on again. But <clears throat> so our, our third clue is in Ephesians chapter 3 that we read. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. That's the secret there. Rooted and and grounded. The Israelites in the time of Malachi were not rooted and grounded in the faith because they got their priorities wrong in giving. Whilst claiming the position of the chosen people, their relationship to God was on the wrong footing. It was a secondary issue to them. 
I have a friend who bought a mountain bike recently, uh, quite an expensive one, I think. They can be very expensive. You know, he had to pay extra to have pedals on it. <laughs> I found that most amusing. I thought, are you sure you've not been diddled? Did the pedals, are you sure that the pedals did not actually come with the bike? I couldn't believe anybody would buy a bike and then pay extra to have pedals. But apparently there were special pedals of some kind. I don't know. I mean, the last time I went to a bike was when I was in a hospital having a heart check. And, uh, and that was one of those that never moved. But he bought this bike, but he had to pay extra for pedals. I said, that's like going to, into a car showroom and then having to picking a new car and having to pay extra to have wheels on it. The idea is ridiculous. It should be part of the whole thing, surely. We should have what God wants for us as part of the whole experience. But it had become a secondary issue to the children of Israel, and it's become something of a secondary issue to the church. Got all kinds of scribbles written down here that I've added and rubbed out and put in, and I can't read half of them, so I'm not going to. But today, there are many in this nation who would claim to be Christ's. Many. All, kind, all walks of life. Some of the most well known names, pop stars and footballers, and all kinds of celebrities would claim to be Christians. And yet, by their very words and actions and lifestyles, proclaim something otherwise. We have indeed leaders in our denominations who hold positions of influence in the churches, and yet they utterly fail to give to the Lord that which is His. They hold back from biblical truth, they take glory to themselves, and the result of that is we have a national church scene today where blessing has been withdrawn and the glory of the Lord has departed and the people haven't realized. Paul exhorts us to know the love of Christ which patheth knowledge that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3.19 When a church leader proclaims doubt upon the resurrection or belittles the virgin birth or pours scorn on the fundamental truths of justification by faith then we can only assume that he does not have this knowledge of the love of Christ ruling in his heart. Verse 18 of Ephesians 3 refers to comprehending, at least it does in the AV. You may well ask the question, if it passeth knowledge, how can we comprehend it? It sounds like a contradiction. It's one of those things that an unbeliever or a theologian, which amounts to the same thing often, an unbeliever would tell you there's a contradiction there in that verse because it tells you that you should understand something which is beyond understanding. How can you do that? Many would say that's impossible. But the original word translated comprehend carries the meaning of to experience or to become a reality. It means that we as Christians can have a full experience of the love of Christ. It can be the central focus of our faith and an absolute reality in our hearts without actually understanding it with our minds. I don't understand why the Lord saved me, but I know that he did. And I can enjoy the full blessing of salvation without understanding why Jesus actually did it. And then we shall be filled with God's fullness. It's that old illustration, isn't it, of a sponge that I'm sure you've heard before. If you press a sponge down into the water for long enough, you'll see the bubbles escaping from it. And as it soaks up more and more of the water, so the air is squeezed out by all the little bubbles. And when the bubbles finally stop, then you can let the sponge go and it will stay submerged. It won't pop back up to the top anymore after the last bubble has gone because all the air has gone because at that point the sponge becomes fully saturated. It's remained in the water for so long that it can literally take no more. Just like we, if we remain and abide in the Lord Jesus Christ and continue daily to seek his face, we can also become so filled with the love of Christ that all other concerns are squeezed out. No longer will the waters of blessing run away, but they will remain our daily portion as, we, as long as we walk with him. And that which pours out from us will be more of the same. I remind you, I'm not claiming to be there yet. 
Jesus himself said that if you drink of this living water, not only will it revitalize and revolutionize your life, but it will well up and it will pour out to provide living water to others. We need people in the church who are rooted and grounded and know the presence of God and recognize his voice. Revival begins with the individual Christian. There's an old saying which I'm sure you know, revival is not whipped up, it is sent down. Many times Christians have tried to whip it up and that's why they appear to have got something and then it's all disappeared because it's essentially been a work of man. But real revival begins with the individual Christian. It begins in the heart. And once that has come into a right and full relationship with Jesus, then it will begin to pour out to others. Many people being converted, like in the Wesleyan days and in the Hebrides in the 50s, many people being converted, falling down in the street and asking, how can I be saved? That is not revival. That's a result of revival. What we need to pray for is a revival within the fellowship, within the church, within the Christian individual, and the individuals join together as a fellowship, and that then will well up and pour out and start to affect other people. And people may well start to say, what is it that these people have? I want to come and find out what it is that they have. When I was 17, I started to meet people who had something more than me. I'd been brought up in Sunday school. I knew all about Jesus. I knew all the Bible stories. I'd never been a bad kid. I was too scared of my mother ever to be a bad kid. But I would never broke the rules. I never did anything really bad. But I thought I was all right. I thought I was a Christian. But then I met people, some of them the same age as me, who obviously had something I did not have. And I wanted to know what it was because they were so soaked with the blessing of the Lord in their own lives, I recognized something in them that I wanted. Revival is a result of God's people turning once more from the sins and issues of the world and concentrating absolutely on the face of the Holy Lamb of God. And God's promise, I've nearly finished, God's promise is one of abundance. Don't think that God will just let you scrape through. <laughs> it may feel like that sometimes. And it may sometimes feel that you're scraping through with a lot less than what a lot of sinners have got. You know, and I, I regularly see things. You know, I pass, when I walk from my flat, I pass a showroom where they sell cars. And you could buy my flat, I only rent it, but you could buy it three times over for the price of one of those cars. And I think... Yeah, but, and I look at them, and I don't like them. I don't like the flashy kind of cars. You've got to be a look-at-me person to drive a bright red Ferrari. I'm sorry, you know. I'm sorry, Gary, if it's your dream, if it's your dream to buy one. But if you want a flashy car, and you want to, particularly if you, you rev the engine at the traffic lights, it's because you want people to look at you. It's because, essentially, you're inadequate in so many other ways. The car's the only thing you've got you want to show it off. Ron has a sports car, but I don't think it's a Ferrari. Not yet, Not yet but you're on the way there. <laughs> but you look at the cars, and you look at the price tag in the window, £275,000, and that was second-hand. I think it was four years old. £275 for a car. And you think, how can people afford that? Wouldn't it be nice to be able? I wouldn't buy the car. I'd spend the money on something much more sensible, much more useful. But I wouldn't buy the car. But the idea of having the resources to be able to spend that much money on a car. And it's easy to think, you know, it'd be nice to be able to. But we have something far, far better than that. Not saying no Christians ever drive Ferraris, but the vast majority of people who drive those kind of cars will not have the blessing of salvation in their soul because that kind of blessing usually comes from a particular kind of lifestyle. But God's promise is one of abundance. Ephesians 3.20 tells us he is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or even think. The Holy Spirit through Malachi tells us that God will open the very windows of heaven. It's something which most of us have never yet seen. And it begins 
in our own hearts. If each of us here in this church were to come this morning into that perfect position of 100% sacrifice to the Lord, our lives, our wills, our possessions, our hopes, then that wonderful promise would come true in our communal experience. And if it became reality in this small body of believers, then it could become a reality across Southport and even across Merseyside. This does not concern itself with earthly things. What many understand, what many misunderstand, is that for God to bless, there must be a lot happening. Don't make that mistake. Churches where there is a lot happening are seen to be experiencing revival, whereas this may not be the case at all. The Lord speaks through John to the church at Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, and he says, you have a name for being alive. It's not the same thing as actually being alive, is it? When I first moved to a particular part of the country, and I was wondering which church I should go to because I didn't know anything about the area. I didn't have very long to prepare to go. It was all rather unexpected. And uh, several people said, oh, you must go to that church. Several people told me the same thing. You must go to that church. So I set off on the Sunday morning to that church. Couldn't find anywhere to park. It was packed. The car park was already full. There were lots of people going in. I thought, well, it must be good. Yeah, everybody's told me to go to that church. And, but I couldn't find anywhere to park. I went around the block twice. And I thought, well, it's going to be late for the service if I can't find somewhere to park. And I'm not going in late. That's embarrassing. And I went to the end of the street to turn around. I said, Lord, I'll give it one more go, but you've got to guide me. And I went to the end of the street to turn around to come back and tucked away at the end of the street a little gospel hall. Plenty of spaces to park. <laughs> and something said to me, there's a space to park outside that little fellowship. So I did. And I picked up my Bible and I went in. And there was only about 12 people. As soon as I walked through the door, a guy came across and said, how wonderful to see you. We've been praying for you to come this morning or something. He didn't know who I was. It wasn't me personally who we were praying for. They'd been praying for somebody to walk in. And I went into that little fellowship. And I was only in that part of the country for a short time before the Lord moved me on. But I never went anywhere else all the time I lived there. That was the place I needed to be. It was the place God wanted me to be. And then a couple of weeks later, I began to hear the truth about the church I'd been told to go to. The dodgy teaching, the false doctrine from the pulpit, and all the other weird things you get in some very big congregations. And I was so thankful I hadn't followed the advice of all the people. To go to that church because it had a name for being alive. But actually, the little fellowship with 12 old people. I have to be careful when I say that now because it's my birthday this month and I've got a zero on the end of it. So, but those 12 folk in that little fellowship were more alive than any number of people in the big church up the road. The kind of church that everyone in town would say there's a lot going on there actually was in God's sight dead. That gives us something to think about. We can chase excitement... We can occupy ourselves with all kinds of work within the church, even all kinds of evangelism. We can even increase the numbers of the congregation dramatically by one thing or another and still be dead as far as God is concerned. It's about knowing the love of Christ. Knowing the person of Christ so well and so constantly that our lives become rooted and grounded in him. Mary Magdalene in the garden on resurrection day thought that everything she had hoped for had just been blown out of the water. The man who she genuinely loved as a man in the right kind of way and had also come to know as Savior, I believe, had died. And that was it. That was the end of everything. So no wonder she was in the garden, she had tears running down her face. No wonder when this guy approached her, she couldn't see 
clearly who it was because the tears which had been brought about by her situation clouded her vision. That's why she didn't recognize him. She'd walked with the man for three years. Why didn't she recognize him? He wasn't, I don't think he was transformed so much at that point. All the other re disciples recognized him clear enough. I don't think he'd been transformed and glorified to such an extent that he was, you know, but she didn't recognize him. I believe that it's because the tears were clouding her vision. In other words, that which was bothering her, her problems, her heartaches, her disappointment, her sadness, all that was so gathered up in her that for a moment she couldn't see clearly that the Savior had done exactly what he said he would do. He'd risen again on the third day. But when she heard his voice, she knew straight away. And according to the scripture, he only said one word. He only said Mary. And then she knew, through all her tears, through all her distress and all her hardship and all her sadness, she knew. And I've been there. I'll tell you honestly, I've been there. At times of desperate difficulty, through the tears, the Lord has spoken. And I've been encouraged. And no, everything has not suddenly gone right and all the bad things suddenly changed. But you recognize the voice of the one with whom you have walked. This Savior, who we know so well, who we love with all our hearts and whom we want to serve with all our strength will do for us exceedingly, abundantly more than we can ever ask. As Ephesians concludes, unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.